Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Blair Sullivan, who's visiting from Princeton this week, and uh, she's going to tell us about uh, directed triangle feet tense graphs. Thank you, Abhinav. All right, so as Abhinav said, I'm going to talk about dense triangle-free digraphs. Uh, in general, this is about directed cycles and dense digraphs. Pretty much everything I'm going to do today is about graphs with no cycles of length at most three. So This is joint work with Maria Chudnovsky of Columbia University and Paul Seymour of Princeton University until we get to the algebraic number theory part, and that's joint with Mel Nathanson from CUNY. And I'll, I'll tell you when that happens. So. so the motivation for this work is a conjecture by Cachetta and Hagfist from 1978, which says that if you have a simple directed graph on n vertices with minimum out degree r, let's see if we can get that to show a little bit, then there's a directed cycle of length at most n over r. That is, if you have lots of edges leaving every node, you should be able to find somewhere where you can come back to the same node in a short, a short number of jumps. Okay, if true, this is best possible. And the class of extremal examples is formed by taking n vertices in a circular order and connecting each one to the next n minus 1 over k. So you can see in these graphs, in k steps, there's no way you can form a cycle. So there are no cycles of length at most k. And again, the out degree is n over this cycle length. Okay. So for the rest of the talk, if G has no directed cycles of length at most K, we'll call it K-free. And in general, we're going to talk about three free digraphs. So what's known about Cachetta Hagfist? Well, in their original paper, Cachetta and Hagfist proved the case when the out degree was at least two. You got a cycle of length at most N over two. And that case is sort of doable within, you know, half an hour of, of good thought. Uh, Hamadoun's proof for a minimum out degree 3 came about 10 years later in 87. It's a lot trickier. And I must admit that Huang and Reed's proofs from 87 of 4 and 5 are just a little too technical for me to want to read. Okay, So there's a lot of sort of you know, involved algebra and inequalities that aren't very intuitive. Okay, Shen came along in 2000, though, and said as long as the minimum out degree is small relative to the number of vertices, at most about square root of n over 2, then I can prove that Cachetta Hagfist is true. And this was a huge breakthrough. As I said before, we just had a few small constants. And Shin's exact theorem says that if you have n vertices and minimum out degree r, then if n is at least 2r squared minus 3r plus 1, then he can prove Cachetta Hagfist is true. Okay. So what else is known other than these small cases? Not very much. Hamadoun, again, proved it for Cayley graphs. So this is where the connections to additive number theory come in, or when you start looking at these directed graph conjectures on Cayley graphs. So Hamadoun proved this for all n and r when it's a Cayley graph. And then he used coset representations to show that that implied it for any vertex transitive digraph. Okay. So, um, I'd like to give you a flavor of what Hamadoun did for Cayley graphs because the problem I want to think about should have similar nice connections to additive number theory. We just need to figure out what they are. So given a finite group, gamma, we'll write it multiplicatively, and a subset of that group, which does not have to generate it in this case, we define the directed Cayley graph G to be the graph with vertex set the elements of the group, and G1 has a directed edge 2G2 if there's an element of A where G1 times A is equal to G2. So we only use right multiplication. We put in directed edges. Hamadoun proved Cachetta Hagfist using the following theorem of Kemperman. So Kemperman's theorem says if you have any group, gamma, and two finite subsets, so that one is in both of them, but the only way to get one as a product is to take one from each, then you can say something about the size of their product set. 
In particular, the size of AB is at least the size of A plus the size of B minus 1. Okay, so what we do is we say, you know, if the graph is k-free, then we can forbid the element 1 from appearing in the powers of A from 1 up to k minus 1. Right, and then we apply Kemperman's theorem by adjoining 1 to that set. We need 1 in A and B. And, uh, and using this sort of inequality to show that, you know, in, a, in over k is the best you can do. So feel free to stop me if something's unclear or I'm going too fast. So as I said, we concentrate on triangle-free digraphs. And the reason for that is really that kachata hackfist is unknown in the case when minimum out degree is in over 3, and we're looking for directed triangles. So this is sort of surprising. It seems very intuitive that if you're connected to a third of all the other vertices everywhere, that you should get a cycle of length at most 3 somewhere. So this has been open since 78. Kachetta and Hagfist proved the first approximate result. They showed if you have out degree at least you know, 0.38 times the number of vertices, then you can get a directed triangle. And it's become a game. Uh, the record holder in, in this game is Shen, as he is the record holder in almost all games of this type. Uh, and it's a big deal. If, you know, if my advisor thinks we have a chance to beat Shen's constant on any one of these problems, he gets very excited about it. Uh, but Shen is very proud of his records. And if you beat him, he will redouble his efforts to retake the title. It's, it's really quite entertaining. So uh, the history here is Kachetta and Hagfist proved 0.38. Bondi in 97 did some neat subgraph counting where he counted subgraphs of different types on three and four vertices. Got a slightly better bound, 0.379. And Shin improved it to 0.354. And that was all that was known through, through the 1900s. Really recently, Hamburger, Haxel, and Kostachka improved this to 0.35312. It doesn't seem like much, right? I mean, none of these improvements seem huge. But remember, we're only <laughs> aiming for a third here. That's right. So Hamburger, Hacksel, and Kostachka sent this, this, uh, this write-up out by personal communication to the people who were involved in the field. And within, I would say, 48 hours, we had an email from Shen saying, I found a spot where I can improve their algebra. And so he gets an improvement of you know, some 10,000th of a constant. Where is Shen? He's at Texas State. This is a joint paper? Or is so this, um, this paper of Hamburger, Haxel, and Kostachka, I believe, has been submitted to the Electronic Journal of Combinatorics. Uh, I don't know that this improvement by Shen has been published or if he's planning on publishing it. Some part of me hopes not, because <laughs> there's sort of no deep thought improvement on, on Hamburger and Haxel's result. So, so what's neat is that Hamburger, Haxel, and Kostachka to get this latest improvement, used a result that we proved for a problem that's sort of related but doesn't seem on the surface to give any great implications. So let me state this problem for you. So given a triangle-free directed graph, let's let gamma be the number of non-edges. Okay, up here is some formal definition, but I really just mean a pair of vertices with no edge in either direction. And beta be the minimum number of edges you need to delete from G to make it acyclic. So you get to choose whatever subset you want. And you know, beta is the smallest subset you can choose so that when you delete it, G is acyclic. So the motivation for this is take a tournament. If a tournament is triangle free, then it's acyclic. right? So if a directed tournament has no directed triangles, then by definition, it must be acyclic or transitive, which is another word I'll use a lot. So it leads us to believe there should be some strong correlation between beta and gamma when graphs are close to tournaments. Okay, so what we're going to say is that what we can prove is that if a digraph has k non-edges, then you need a set of at most k edges to make it acyclic. And this is joint with Chudnovsky and Seymour. So that is, in this terminology, beta is at most gamma. This proof is sort of slick, but it also feels sort of like a trick. So we define a two-path to be an induced directed two-edge path. So x, y, and z, so you have edges from x to y and y to z, and no edge in either direction between x and z. Then at any vertex, you can count the number of two-paths starting there and the number of two-paths with middle there. 
So this is where a picture is probably helpful. So take V, we'll call his out neighbors A, his in neighbors B, and his non neighbors C. I don't know if you guys have seen this notation before. My advisor claims that this is for before and after. So the vertices before and the vertices after. It's his standard labeling of in neighbors and out neighbors. <laughs> so yeah, what is C? Non neighbors, because I guess it's the next letter in the alphabet. <laughs> Uh, we could call it n, but somehow that seems reserved for the number of vertices. Cloister. Cloister. That's Cloister. Good. All right. I'll go back and report on my progress. <laughs> so if we chose this vertex, so that the number of two edge paths starting there is less than the number of two edge paths with that vertex as the middle, then what that really tells us is that the number of edges here is exactly f of v, that is, it's the number of two edge paths starting at v. Right? The only way to get an induced two edge path is to go through a and then to c. And v, g of v is exactly the number of non-edges between a and b. So if we assume that f is at least g, then we can use induction to prove beta is at most gamma. And all we do is split the graph into g1 and G2, right? And then we apply induction on these two graphs to get betas at most gamma, and then we can kill all directed cycles in the whole graph by deleting these edges from A to C. Since the graph is triangle-free, there are no edges from A to B. Okay, so it's sort of nice. It's a trick. It doesn't give us a whole lot of slack. Yes, just for information, we use this theorem for uh, feedback arc set and uh, to get an algorithm there. And there's a slightly general version which is true. Okay. If, I, if I mark some edges non-removable and then define beta and g as you define, then also it holds. Okay, so pretty much the same. apparently there's a strengthening that I haven't seen yet. Yeah. Uh, and another application besides Hamburger, Haxel, and Kostachka. So what they used this for was to show that there's a vertex of small out degree. But in particular, at most, the square root of 2 beta. And then they were able to plug that in to the known methods for looking at Kachetta Hagfist to get a better bound in triangle-free digraphs. Okay. So I'll talk to you afterwards about that improvement. So this is a nice result, but the problem is we don't think it's best possible. In particular, we think we're off by a factor of two, which when an improvement of a 10,000th is important, is huge. <laughs> okay, so a factor of two is kind of big. In fact, we conjecture that if it's triangle-free, Beta is at most gamma over 2. That is, if you have k non-edges, there's a set of size k over 2 edges that you can delete to make the graph acyclic. And why is this tight? Well, any constant we put on the right would make it tight on tournaments. They have beta and gamma 0, so that's pretty uh, irrelevant. But if you take a directed cycle of length 4, you can see it has two non-edges. It's triangle-free, but you must delete an edge to make it acyclic. That is, beta is 1 and gamma is 2. And this stays tight under substitution. So take a graph where it's tight. For any vertex, you can substitute another graph where it's tight, and it remains tight. So this forms an infinite family you know, from these transitive tournaments on i vertices and the square. Okay. So when you, uh, when you have a graph that satisfies it, we want to take a vertex and replace it by some other graph that satisfies yeah, the conjecture. Right. Yeah, and you make complete graphs. So if it had an edge coming from you, you make you complete to the graph that you substitute for the vertex. So obviously, I can't prove beta is at most gamma over 2, or I would have stated that to begin with. But what I can do is, in two special cases, prove that beta is at most gamma over 2. And these two cases are graphs that are of some interest in sort of this area of digraph theory in general. So we can prove for circular interval digraphs, and digraphs where the vertex set is the union of two cliques that beta is at most gamma over 2. So let me tell you what those are a little more specifically. A circular interval digraph is just a generalization of that example where Kachetta Hagfist is tight. It means there is a circular order on the vertices so that every vertex has out neighbors which are an interval, or equivalently, 
If you pick three vertices in the circular order, u, v, and w, and the edge from u to w is in, that forces the edges from u to v and v to w to be in. So if an edge is in, everything sort of under it toward the circle is also in. Okay, so these are circular interval digraphs. An equivalent characterization is that the in neighbors and the out neighbors of every vertex are a clique. Okay, and that's, that's non-trivial and not published yet. But uh, the other thing is that if we can partition the vertex so set. Uh, well, in this case, they're triangle free, so they're transitive tournaments. But in general, I define a clique to be a graph with exactly one edge between any two vertices. One directed edge. Right, so they're, they're simple in that I don't allow multiple edges in the same direction. And since they're triangle free, I don't allow cycles of length two. <laughs> okay. So the other class we can show are when the vertex set is the union of two cliques. That is, there is a partition into V1 and V2 such that when you restrict G to VI, you get a tournament. Okay. So these are the two cases where we can prove our conjecture. And I'd like to spend a few minutes giving you a flavor for the proof of the second one. Okay, I think it's really interesting, and it uses some, some non-trivial stuff from function theory, which you wouldn't expect to pop up. Um, the proof for circular interval graphs is also neat, but it, it really counts on this structure of out neighbors being an interval. So we use induction, and when you have a circular interval graph, if you delete any longest edge, it remains a circular interval graph. So we have a way to create smaller graphs remaining in the class. Okay. So let's look when the graph is the union of two cliques. So some notation. Hopefully this isn't too painful. We're going to write the vertex set as m union n of size is little m and little n respectively. And we want to find a subset of the edges so that when we delete it, it's acyclic. And we'd like to prove that the size of this set's at most gamma over 2. So say the minimum such set has size k. Okay. So step one is to define a cross. So when we have a graph that's the union of two cliques, we can draw the two cliques, which must be transitive tournaments, as directed downward. And we're going to label the vertices on the left as u1 to um going down, and the vertices on the right as v1 to vn going up. Okay, and that's just because it makes defining these pairs a little bit easier. So, is there an arrow in the So the arrow is going down in both of them. So the transitive tournaments are directed downward in both cases. So we really are labeling them sort of opposite. One we're labeling from tail to head. Right. So we want to define a cross. So I'm going to say a cross is a pair of edges that looks like this picture. In other words, it's a pair of pairs of indices, A, B, where the first pair of indices is i, j, and the edge is directed from j to i. And the second pair is i prime, j prime, where the edge is directed from i prime to j prime. OK. So what's not obvious immediately is that if you could kill all the crosses, you could kill all the cycles. So any directed cycle must use a cross. And that follows from the graph being triangle free. But even more, if you need k edges, to kill all the cycles, then there are k edge disjoint crosses. If you need k edges to kill all the cycles, then there are k edge disjoint crosses. And this follows from Koenig's theorem. We take these AIs and these BIs and we form a bipartite graph. And we say if there's no way to you know, hit all the edges with, with size x, then you know, we get the appropriate bound. Okay. So, so this is nice. We can go from looking at making the graph acyclic to removing all the crosses in the graph. And this might be a little easier to handle. But the problem is right now, I'd like to prove that k is at most gamma over 2. And gamma has not appeared on this slide except at the top. I have no non-edges defined in my graph. So I need a way for the crosses to give me non-edges. So in particular, each cross amazingly gives me two non-edges, which I label C and D. This is because the graph is triangle free. And I'm sorry about the flickering. I, I'm not causing it that I know of. <laughs> okay. So that is, because the graph is triangle free, if you follow the, the edge up and the cross to the right, if there were an edge where D is going to the left, you'd get a triangle on the left. 
And if it went the other way, you'd also get a triangle. So we have two non-edges associated with every cross. And even better, they're disjoint sets of non-edges. My C's and my D's don't intersect. But I understand that sort of D and C can't have edges in one direction, but why can't it have an edge in either direction? Um, so let's, let's take C, for example. So C is in, so our cross looks like this. So if we add an edge in this direction, we get a directed triangle here. And if I reverse the arrow, I get a directed triangle in the other direction. Okay. So, so another proof by Pictor occurs to show that C and D are disjoint sets. Suppose we had a non-edge which was labeled C for one cross and D for another cross. So it looks like this. Well, not only do we get one triangle, but we get two. So take the triangle composed of two green edges and a red edge on either side. Okay. So that is the size of C union D is exactly the size of C plus the size of D. And it's at most the number of non-edges. Right? So now if we think about our crosses, sorry? The closest that you start with are our edge disjoint. That's right. So if we have, if we need k edges to kill all directed cycles, then we can form k edge disjoint crosses. In terms of vertices, they don't need to be disjoint. They don't need to be vertex disjoint. Only so edge why, disjoint. So you say that the number of c edges that you get is equal to the number of crosses, or yes. So every crosses sharing their bottom. Okay, so I mean, we can show that this doesn't happen. Um, right, yeah, it's a, it's a similar argument, so it's, it works similarly. So we can show that, you know, we have C plus D and it's at most gamma, and if we recall, we have that the size of A and the size of B are both at least beta, the number of edges we need to delete. So it suffices to prove that C times D is at least A times B. And this is just arithmetic geometric mean. Right, so if we could show that C times D was at least beta squared, then gamma is at most two beta, or at least two beta, and that's exactly what we wanted. Okay. So the last step is where function theory comes in. And I don't know how familiar you are with Al Swade and Dakin's four function theorem. Apparently this shows up a lot with correlation inequalities. Okay, so Al Swade and Dakin had a four functions theorem. That's what came to mind when we wanted to show that A times B was at most C times D, because we could take their characteristic functions. But it turns out that we can't show our function satisfy the conditions for Al Schwed and Dakin's function. So we proved another version. Okay, so we said if we take P to be the set of all pairs of indices, and we have functions from P to the real numbers, the positive reals, so that you know, A times B is at most C times D when the indices are in the right order. And for any two subsets, if A plus B is bigger than A of the whole set, then we got domination, right? So, so there is a point in Y that dominates a point in X, okay? And it's easy to check that our characteristics function satisfy these two conditions. And our conclusion is then that A times B on the whole set is at most C times D which is exactly what we wanted. I feel like this is a bit of a big hammer, right? We, we're trying to show something in digraphs. We're using sort of a big hammer, but it works out nicely. I just wonder if there are other places we can use it where we haven't seen that yet. Okay, and now we're going to switch gears completely. So I mentioned that Kachetta Hagfist has nice connections to additive number theory. We can prove it. You sure. Have you looked at other sort of generalizations of the four functions here? Uh, I have not. Um, I know that in all the research we did, we could not find this generalization of the four functions theorem. But do you mean, could we prove other similar things? Right, which might be useful. I haven't thought about it. Okay. So, so we can prove Kachetta Hagfist for Cayley graphs using Kemperman's, Kemperman's lemma, which is a nice tool for additive number theory, sort of like Cauchy Davenport. 
So when we were able to prove this k over, this k over 2 conjecture, k is the number of non-edges, my advisor yells at me when I call it that, because he says k over 2 conjecture is not descriptive in any way. <laughs> That's OK. Regardless, we can prove this conjecture for some classes of digraphs, and we can prove kachetta hagfist for Cayley graphs. So maybe we could try our new conjecture on Cayley graphs. The problem is, it turns out, to not be nearly as obvious what tools in additive number theory we're going to need. So I can't prove it for Cayley graphs. And even worse, I can't prove it for Cayley graphs on Z mod PZ, where P is prime. OK? So, so you would think if you were hopeful that you could prove it for Cayley graphs, this would be a good place to start. These have tons of structure. So let's talk about what this problem means for Cayley graphs on Z mod PZ, because it turns out to have interesting questions in projective space. Okay. So if we have a Cayley graph on Z mod PZ, we can write the vertices from 0 to P minus 1. And we can define our edges t to go from <coughs> vertex i to i plus a sub j, where a sub j's form these, this subset of my group. And what do I need? I need a subset of the edges I can delete to make the graph acyclic. Okay. One good candidate would be the subsets given by linear orders. So I take a linear order of the vertex set, and I delete all the edges going backwards. Okay? Certainly, that's going to make the graph acyclic. And if we take special linear orders, it turns out that these subsets of edges are easy to count. Okay? So what linear orders am I going to take? I'm going to take those where the vertices are ordered as k, 2k, 3k, up to k times p minus 1, where k is anything from 1 to p minus 1. Okay. So let's write that down on a little more explicitly. If you take the linear order where you multiply by k, then sorry, the number of edges that go backwards is precisely the sum from 1 to d, where d is the degree, of ai over k mod p. Okay, so think about it in the circle. That's the way I like to think about it. Put them in the circular order, again, multiplying by k, and cut between 0 and 1. It doesn't matter. All the cuts are the same. But you want to cut it into a linear order. So cut it between 0 and 1. So here's, and I guess we're multiplying by k here. Then the number of edges of type ai that cross this cut for my linear order is precisely ai divided by k. That's how many of them are going to come, come across here. right? That's how many vertices back I'm going to go. So I believe that in this case, for Cayley graphs on Z mod PZ, not only is the conjecture true that we can find a subset of the edges that's small enough, one of these sets is good enough. So these are certainly not all the candidates for deleting to make the graph acyclic. But I think one of them should be small enough. That is the minimum from k to 1 to p minus 1 of the sum of ai over k mod p should be at most, well, gamma over 2. The number of non-edges in this graph is p times p minus 2d minus 1 over 2. And then we have the 4 because we want a 2 there. Okay. We need some conditions on our ais because we assumed our graph was triangle free. And we also assume that we don't have multiple edges or loops. Right, so we don't want our AIs to be 0, and we don't want any 1, 2, or 3 of them to sum to 0. Sorry. And the other thing that you might want to think about is I don't like division, especially when I'm dealing with Z mod PZ. But since we're taking the minimum overall k, it's OK to switch from division by k here to multiplication. OK, so we can really write this as the sum of k times ai mod p. And that seems nicer somehow. So this is where Mel Nathanson came in. I showed him this problem, and he said, oh, that's really a problem about projective space. OK, so take projective space of dimension d minus 1 over the field of p elements. Then if we take our our AIs that give us our edges, those are a point in projective space. And we can define a height function to be exactly this sum. Okay? And then the question is, 
if we look at projective space and we exclude these hyperplanes given by no ai is zero, no two summed to zero, can we get an upper bound on this height function? And the general answer is no, even in P2. I can't do this when the dimension is two in general. So what we can prove? Well, we can prove that the height is at most, well, the conjecture says that this is at most P times P minus 2D minus 1 over 4. So in general, we can show it's at most D times P over 2. Okay, so I'm using D star because you only need to consider non-zero AIs. So D star is the number of non-zero AIs in your point. Then for if any point, hmm? If you say it's flashing, he'll stop it from flashing probably. It stops by itself? Okay. It stops when she changes the slide. Yeah, when, when it's readjusting, I guess. So what we can prove is the height of any point is at most the number of non-zero elements in that point times P over 2. So it's easy to get that times P. The over 2 comes from an averaging argument. Okay, this, is, this is not a very complicated trick. Okay, so we just average over all the I from 1 to D. There are points that achieve equality. Fortunately for us, these points are not, they, they live in these excluded hyperplanes. Okay, so these points that achieve equality have zeros or inverses or a set of three that sum to zero. Okay. When we restrict to D equals two, the simplest case that it makes sense to think about, note that you can assume that the first AI is one. None of them are zero, so we can scale. So we can assume that we have a point of the form one A and we can show that the point has height at most p minus 1 over 2. Okay, so this already was sort of a non-trivial thing to prove. I think that we should be able to show p over 3. Numerical evidence for some very large primes seems to support this. But I can't prove there's a gap. And in general, we sort of think there should be gaps in the height function, that it should only take on rational fractions of p. Okay. And that's something I would have never guessed, except that you know, we ran some numerical data and graphed it, and it turns out that it only takes on p over k for, for integer k, which is sort of surprising. So some open problems. Back to the beginning, if you have a triangle-free digraph, can you show that there's a subset of size any constant less than 1 times the number of non-edges that will make the graph acyclic? We can prove 1. We can prove a half in a few special cases. We can't prove a constant less than 1 for anything else. You mean like, one less. like minus 1 or minus 2? Uh, we haven't really concentrated on doing that, um, so I don't know. I don't know of a way to do it right now. Right. So if it's a Cayley graph, I'd like to see an algebraic proof, even that beta is at most gamma. So we have this sort of general theorem that says beta is at most gamma. We picked a vertex in a very careful way. I can't find an algebraic proof for Cayley graphs that even that weaker result is true. So any algebraic proof would be nice. If you can get C less than 1, that's even better. Okay. And in our proof that beta is at most gamma, we actually constructed a partition of the vertex set. So the number of edges in one direction was at most the number of non-edges between them. Right? We had the, the out neighbors and the in neighbors union the non-neighbors. We showed that the number of edges in one direction was small enough that induction let us win. So Bruce Reed asked, is this strengthening true? So analogously, in general, can you partition the vertex set so the number of edges from one to the other is at most half the number of non-edges? So this is a strict strengthening of betas at most gamma over two. We have no idea how to do this even where we can prove betas at most gamma over two. Circular interval graphs, graphs that are the union of two cliques, we can't prove the strengthening for either one. We also don't have a counterexample. So. And then for height functions, there are lots of open questions. Can you give a simple expression for this height function in any given dimension? Or a way to approximate it? I can't do either. When we exclude the hyperplanes that make the graph triangle free, what's the tight upper bound? So we have an upper bound that's something like p squared over 4. But it looks like the upper bound should be linear. p 
p over 3, 2p over 3, and 7p over 6 are our conjectures for dimensions 2, 3, and 4. But I don't know what the conjecture should be for dimension 5. I'm sure my C program could run a little while and probably tell me. But what's the general pattern, and can we prove it's tight? Okay. So I think that's about everything. With the one half, uh, what would that give for the C H conjecture? What would it give for Cateta Hagfist? Yes. So what it would do is allow uh, ha Hamburger, Haxel, and Kostachka's method to find a vertex. So they have square root of 2 beta of G. I think it would improve that by a factor of 2. And we did the calculations. I think you get something like maybe 0.349. It's not huge, but it would give a, a significant improvement. And if we were careful, we'd go ahead and play Shin's trick before he got to. We'd make sure our algebra was very tight. Thank you.